All right, it has been a phenomenal service so far. I want to say thank the song leaders for that incredible singing right there. That was awesome. Get my laptop fixed up right here. There we go. All right. Well, I thought Chanel did a... Whoa, how about that? All right. The photographers thank me for fixing the mic. Amen. Awesome. I thought Chanel did a particularly amazing job uh, sharing for communion. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad our little daughter has found her way. That's, uh, that's awesome. You know, today uh, is going to be a great day. Today, Eric, Ruth, and Abraham are all going to be baptized. We're going to see three baptisms today. And I want to discuss three words. Peace, purpose, and power. The title of our lesson is A Superior Sanctuary. A Superior Sanctuary. You know, the Bible calls me as the evangelist of the church to build our church exactly the way God says to build it. Not the way I want it, not the way you want it, but that we follow the teachings involved with church building as we build our church. What most are not highly sensitized to in that is that the building of the church is the building of your life. And in that way, you are called to build the church by living the most powerful life that can be lived, the life of following Jesus Christ. See, you were called to live that life. Which means your life will only be as powerful as you are obedient to Christ. It is life to the full. It's the best life that can be lived. It's the most powerful life that can be lived. But it's not powerful unless you obey Jesus. Because just like he gives us principles for church building, he gives you elementary principles of how to live your life. He gives me those. And so our life will be powerful to the degree that you and I build our life exactly the way the Bible calls us to live. Paul says in a couple of places in 1 Thessalonians and in Timothy to take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. That means there is a pattern of elementary teachings. We see them referenced in Hebrews 6. That, that every believer should be obeying on a daily basis. It should be the basis of the way they live their lives. It should be the start of them being brought to maturity as Christians. And the degree to which you live that life exactly the way you should in each situation will be the degree that you live the most powerful life possible. Why does the Bible call you to these things? See, we're called by God. Because you and I have a calling. I, I, you know, I appreciate that today we lifted up all those that are serving. And of course, I, I, I failed to acknowledge Marquesa and Naomi and the way they serve the deaf ministry constantly. Well, you move your hand just the slightest way and it's a different word. They must do the signs exactly according to the pattern set for deaf language and for signing. And yet, the AV people are, do the AV stuff, the counters do their stuff, but that's their role. It's not their calling. Our service to God cannot become our calling because we all, paid in the ministry or not, have a calling from God. Can I get a bigger amen on that one? Amen. You know, in the early days of being called, virtually every minister 
struggles to embrace that calling. How do I know it's from God? Well, if it's a calling and it's real, we are all men and women under authority, under spiritual authority of other leaders. And so if the person God picked to be in that authority calls you, what do you think that means? Right? We wrestle and over-spiritualize things. God uses mistakes too, so we're, that's our fear, is that some man's making a mistake with us and our life's going to pay for it. And, and yet, God works through mistakes, does he not? And so there's no need to wrestle with embracing something that we know God calls us to be disciples, like our three who have come to be baptized. Yeah. Boy, what if Eric questioned? I, what if... Is Kadesha really from God? Am I really supposed to go to church with her? See, we're called by men, and we're called to service by men. And God never makes mistakes, particularly when he fixes the mistakes of men. So we never have to struggle with being called or not. Consider four men who were called. And why am I speaking about men who were called to lead God's people? Because everybody's a leader. If you're following Jesus, Jesus led the way. And, and, and we lead the way in his stay nowadays. We're the ones that he's called upon. Consider Moses when he was called. Exodus 4, 10 through 14. I'm slow speech. Some, they, some, some, some translations say he was stuttered. Because the word is often used for stuttering, but but slow of speech is like I can't get up in front of people and know what to say. I'm I, I'm not quick to know what to say. Was that the truth? Can you lead two million people when you're slow of speech? Can only lead them to exactly where they're already at. He was powerful in speech, and we know this. Why do we know this? Hebrews tells us the truth about Moses. He was powerful in speech. He was powerful in action. But he thought of himself as not being that. Consider Gideon. Gideon's one of my favorites. Judges 6, 6, 13 through 17, he says, he's called, he goes, but I'm the weakest in Manasseh. We're the weakest tribe, and I'm the weakest in the tribe. Is that how things turned out? So was it, was, was it the truth? Actually, in Gideon's case, it was. Gideon's case, it was. It was the weakest tribe. And, okay, he was in a wine press, threshing wheat. You thresh wheat with a fork over your shoulder. A wine press back then was about that high, and it was really small. So he was in a wine press, thrust threshing wheat because he was so scared of the enemies because he was the weakest. He was absolutely right about himself. But the Spirit of God loves weakness. It calls weakness out of weakness, and it makes our weaknesses our strengths. Then there's Jonah. Judges 6, 13 through 17. I mean, sorry, Jonah. Jonah 1, 1 through 4. 8 through 10. Just read the whole thing if you're brilliant. God calls him to go to Nineveh to save his people. There was one problem. Those ain't my people. He was racist. And he was called by God. To save, yes, his people because they were God's people. What was his reply? You know, he was kind of like, he was kind of like Adam in the garden. He was kind of like Cain when God stopped him on the way to going to kill his brother. He gave no answer. Gave no answer. Because I don't like those people. You can't follow Jesus and not like any people. You, you, you gotta love people. And yet, if we respond like Jonah, and go sit up on our hill, looking over the city, evaluating everyone, looking down upon them. 
angry because I don't have the role I want. Well, you know, what you do is you make yourself very comfortable in that place. You put shade over his head. And so God provided a worm, ate away the shade, nice big old sunburn on Jonah's head. He goes, do you have a right to be angry? He goes, I do. I'm angry enough to die. What a drama queen. (laughs) And nonetheless, he did preach and God still saved the people and Jonah ended up on the hill angry. Why? He chose that. If you've been feeling angry lately about anything that you've held on to more than a day, because you know, we can get angry till the sun goes down, then, then, then maybe you want to consider what happened to Jonah while well, he sat in his anger. And save yourself the sunburn. Then there's Samson. Samson is the big, cool dude. He's muscular, he's cut. He's awesome. Judges 14. (laughs) Samson is called from birth. He knows he's called from birth. He is appointed the leader, but he doesn't lead. Isn't it interesting? Samson would not lead, but God didn't change his calling. He didn't pick another one since he didn't lead. See, God doesn't think like we do. Get that guy out of here, man. God doesn't take his people out, nor are you going to take his people out that he chooses to lead until he's ready for them to be out. So stop complaining. Right? That's, the, that's the moral of the story there. I've had people half my age with no kids disciple me. When I went back to L.A., we had Colton and Mandy Roan, who did have a couple of girls, but they're half our age. We've been around three times longer than them, and they were our disciples, and we happily followed them. We have a great relationship with Colt. We touch base this week because we just touch base to keep in contact. Then, then you had Jared and Rachel McGee disciple us, and and they had young kids, and and you know they helped us with ministry, and we helped them with raising kids, and we and we helped them with their marriage, and and that's because we're partners. We don't disregard what God allows to happen because I'm older. Because you can't relate, you can't help me. Where, well, where's the Bible in all that? Right? Samson's problem is that everything had to be fun or he wouldn't put his heart into it. And, and you know, he lived a self-indulgent life, giving into his desires, womanizing. I mean, God's leader for years was womanizing. See, see, modern Christianity is like, let's have a meeting with the board. Okay, we're going to put you out. But that's not God and Bible. God takes the lead. He puts a rank leader in there for a reason. To see if you're really following him or following the leader exactly. See if you'll overlook some of the things happening and, and, and be family with that leader until they change, like they'll look, overlook yours and be family with you. Make no mistake, we have a high standard for sin. If I'm messing around, you won't see me around much longer. Because we are all under authority. When the, when the proper structure of authority is in place in the church, I'm accountable to those over me and I'm accountable to all of you. And there's no messing around. The biggest thing is Samson is, one, he wouldn't lead. So imagine, they they were supposed to have a leader, but they didn't the entire time he was leading until the day he died. But he had lots of victories. The problem is, he would only muster his strength to do something that could bring himself glory, rather than giving God glory for his strength and the victories that he had. They spent their time, all of these men, trying to tell God who they are. Well, this is who I am and this is where I'm at. Rather than letting God's word tell them who they need to be. Let's have a little Bible study to prepare our heart for today's lesson. Three life-changing words. Go to John 15, verse 10. John 15, verse 10.
This one has to do with purpose and peace. Jesus says, if you obey my commands. So then there's a if you do and if you don't, right? If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Well, what if I don't? And I don't remain in his love. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. And your joy may be complete. Anybody in here, could you use your joy being complete today? Or are you just as joyful as you could possibly be? Everything's awesome. You know where you're at when people are like, hey, how you doing? You're like, eh, I'm doing right. I'm here. In quite a week. It's really tough to be saved. It's really tough to have the Holy Spirit living in me, you know. It's always telling me what to do. It's just, yeah, it's been a tough week. It can only be a tough week if you don't remain in his love. It can only be a so-so week if you don't remain in his love. It can only be a fired-up week if you are remaining in his love. I mean, this is a huge thing. He's talking about the vines and the branches. He's talking about being cut off or not being cut off. And how long was he pulled up with lukewarmness, right? He goes on in verse 12, he says, my command. Okay, oh, command. You like that, right? There's a difference between, hey, could you take the trash out? You need to take the trash out right now. It's a totally different thing. I had that with my kid. Every time he'd walk near the trash, hey, Dev, take, I'm already doing it, Dad. No, the last nine times you walked by it, that's what I'm telling you. Now I'm commanding you, take out the trash, dude. Don't, tell, don't, no talk back. Why? Why do I say no talk back? Because I'm made in the image of God, so I treat my kid like God thinks of me. No talk back. No talk back. He says, love each other. As, no, 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 you have your own way of loving, right? When you don't get loved the way you want, don't you complain sometimes? All right, all right. Well, maybe your way is not the way Jesus is saying to be loved. Maybe the timing's different. Maybe the tone is different. Maybe the, the pressure involved with it's different. Love each other as I have loved you. Are you doing it? Here's how we read this. My command is this. Be loved by everyone as Jesus loved me. See, it doesn't say to be loved. It says to love. See, we get mad because I'm not loved, and you're not loved because you're not giving love. You have to not be giving love to feel unloved. <laughs> You can clap, that's fine. It's a pretty fired up statement. It's not my idea, so it's cranking. Greater love has no one than this. This is the greatest way to love. Lay your life down for your friends. See, but we read it the other way. Greater love can I receive nowhere else that my friends lay down their life for me. So this is where our thoughts dwell whether somebody's doing it for us or not. Because we're really here for to be loved, not to follow God at different times. He says, you are my friends. Fired up to be Jesus' friend. You fired up to be Jesus' friend today? <laughs> Woo! He says, all right, you're my friends. If you do what I command. So if I'm not obeying Jesus, what does that mean for me? But I'm saved. Well, maybe not forever. Hebrews 6 teaches us all about it. It's really hard to do, though. You have to really try to go to hell, let me tell you. You're my friends if you do what I command. 
He goes, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. This is so cool. We get to know the master's business. It's awesome. Let me tell you what, the master's business is soul business. And if you get about his business, he'll be about your business. That's the way the Bible works. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear it at the end of this as well. He says, instead, I've called you friends because, right? I've called you friends because everything I learned, I made known to you. You, are, you have a calling, and part of your calling is to make known to others everything God has made known to you. You did not choose me. You didn't choose me because you don't want to live this life. You did not choose this life. You don't want to live it because you don't know the power of it. He said, I chose you, and I appointed you. You go, that's the apostles. Yeah, but on the mountain in the Great Commission, he said, go make disciples, make baptize them in the Father, Son, and teach, teach them to obey everything I commanded you, including this command that you're appointed. So it's not just for the apostles, it's for everyone. Right? Pointed you to what? Go bear fruit. You know, you got to go to do it. But you're supposed to bear fruit. You can't bear the fruit of God's Spirit while you're complaining about life, about somebody, while your thoughts dwell on others, while your nasty attitude is keeping you from bearing fruit. Right? It's impossible to do both of those at the same time. And you are not appointed to have attitude. You are appointed to bear fruit and fruit that lasts. He goes, okay, now you got it. Now when you do it, then something happens. Well, what's that? Then, right? Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now you know why God's not answering these prayers. Now you know why God's saying no, not yet. You get about my business, I'll get about your prayer business. If you ask in my name. Do you know why no disciple in history has ever won the lottery? Because you really can't really pray that in Jesus' name. We think we can, but history has shown you can't. Maybe somebody will. This is my command. Love each other. Love each other. See, you didn't choose God. You weren't searching for him to find him. He found you. Maybe you wanted to know him, but he still found you. He found you, he brought you, and the brothers and sisters helped you. And they got out of the way and introduced God's word to you. And God's word did all the work. So you got to remember that in a Bible study, right? You don't do the work. You just share the word. God does everything. Right? Once you fulfill your purpose, see, power, peace, purpose, and power. See, once you're at peace, you can obey any time, no matter what's happening. Then you have purpose. Your purpose is to live the exact life that Jesus calls you to live. Your mission gives you the power to influence somebody else to take on the calling and to be appointed. You know, in 2009, D.C. was a mission team, right? Andrew and Patrick came here. They planted the church with power. It was awesome. Well, last year, we sent another team. Tracy and I were on that team. We don't send teams of people to 100-person churches because they're doing great. We, see, we send teams of people to churches that need a boost because there's lukewarmness. And, it, you know, things have been awesome since we've been here. I, I've been pushing and pushing. You've been feeling it, right? You've been pushing. And you know what I feel? Push back, push back, push back. It's okay. We're in a, we're in a symbiont relationship, me and all of you. It's time to stop pushing back. It's time to stop being lukewarm, some of you. It's time to accept your calling. Accept your appointment by God today. Today's a new day in the church. Today, nothing will be different after today. Because after we go through what we're going through here today, you're going to see how serious it is. Why it can't wait even another week for you to be you. 
some point on every mission team, you lose the mission because you've lost the team. Or vice versa. Start highlighting each other's sins. The talk is about all the things that are wrong and all the sins that are being committed. Let's, let's all pull together. I don't like the way you said that. I can't overlook it. Let's stop the evangelistic efforts of the church because I don't like the way you talk to me. Those days are over. I've gotten a couple of calls this week. I'd like to talk to you about something that happened. I want to get some advice. I don't like the way this was done and I want to go, no, 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 move along. Go do your purpose. Overlook it. I'm not going to sanction that anymore. Be strong spiritually and overlook the little minor offenses for the sake of others being saved. As disciples of Jesus, we are the new covenant representation of something very powerful. I mean, very powerful. In fact, there's nothing more powerful. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's see what we can glean from the book of Hebrews this morning. Hebrews 5. Let's see what this superior sanctuary is. Of course, you're going to want to reference the bulletin that was handed to you today. Can I get everybody's commitment that you will read this? Because it goes right along with the sermon today. All right, I need, I need a bunch of Bereans here. Hebrews 5, verse 7. Let's talk about Jesus' prayer life. Let's compare his prayer life to our prayer life. I believe this describes why the apostles went to Jesus to say, teach me to pray. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions. Who's ever signed a petition? You're supposed to be petitioning God. Not asking him once and then copping an attitude because he didn't say yes to you yet. Or he said no. The persistent widow. In the days of Jesus' life, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. Loud cries and tears. Does this describe your prayer life regularly? Is your prayer life marked with Jesus' stamp? Of the way he went to the Father? If not, now you know why there's not power in your life. As, I mean, that power is living inside of you already. To the one who could save him from death. See, we don't take prayer seriously because we don't fear dying lukewarm. Jesus feared messing up because he would have gone right to hell with us as a man, if he hadn't chosen righteousness always and gone on to holiness and gone on to the mind that only Christ to this day has had. He says, and he was heard because of something. He was heard because of his reverent submission. I know you love that word. It gets quiet every time. <laughs> Women, you can just know this word is for everybody. Men and women. What was he submitting to is the question. What was he submitting to? His calling that he was appointed to. Now, how about you? You have a calling. I can tell you the vast majority of us in this room have not embraced it because you are not bearing fruit. The lack of visitors being brought in shows it, proves it. The lack of baptism shows the lack of the evidence of the grace of God working in your life. But today's a new day. It's all behind us. Next week, I won't be talking about lukewarmness. It'll be wonderful. We're heard in our prayers because of our reverent submission. Make no mistake, there are times before we're Christians and after that God does not hear prayers that we pray. We can shut the ears of God so he doesn't hear our prayers. Husbands, you know this to be true. Don't take care of your wife. She's not radiant. God hinders your prayers. And there's other things as well. Just thought I'd hit the married people a little bit. 
Although he was a son, he learned obedience. How do you learn obedience? From what he what? You don't even like to say it, huh? How do you learn obedience? But really, are you? Is that true for you? Is your life marked that your learning comes through what you're suffering? Or are you running like for the hills every time they're suffering? I got to go be with God. And then no loud cries and tears, just anger like Jonah up on the hill. Not embracing the call to go bear fruit that lasts. Once made perfect, he became the eternal source of salvation for all who what? Why doesn't it say all who believe in him? Why doesn't it say that? There's not a translation out there that it says believe in him. Because belief and obedience are one and the same. Don't believe me? Go back and read chapters 3 through 5. Be given an expository teaching on what obedience looks like. The one required to enter God's rest. And those who don't obey don't enter the rest. They can claim faith, they can claim I believe all they want, but they won't enter the rest if they're not obeying. Obedience is the stamp of authenticity on faith. You can write that down. Obedience is the stamp of authenticity on your faith. No obedience, fake in the funk. RC Cola, dollar store cola, not Coca-Cola. See? Not what James calls saving faith. Teleos faith. The Greek word is perfect can't live a perfect life, but you can have a perfect faith that gets you through the challenges of life. And he says, and he was designated by God. You're designated for something too. Every one of you. To be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then I love what he says after that. He goes, well, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're so slow to learn. You're so lukewarm. He says, in fact, well, by this time you ought to be teachers. You're not, you're not teaching anybody. You're not getting into studies. You're not, you're not showing anybody the word of God. So you need milk, not solid food. And you know this exclamation point. He was yelling that. It's time to break open that first principles app. It's time to actually listen to the audios, remnant brothers and sisters, my veterans, and learn the new dynamics in the way that we teach the studies that have changed. So you can stop doing them the way you did in the 90s. And come on up to speed. You got your new cell phone. Just get the new dynamic of how to teach this generation. What worked in the 90s doesn't work now. Same teachings, different approach to make them work. Amen? See, Jesus suffered. So we suffered in prayer. So we would be inspired because he did it as a regular guy. He did not use divine power to obey God. He used sheer grit and will and absolute love for his father in heaven. He stayed focused on his purpose during the most difficult times. What was the best example? <laughs> Hanging on the cross. Mother, take care of your son. Son, this is your mother. Father, they don't know what they're doing. It's okay. I got this. He laid him, his Bible says he laid himself on the cross. Can you imagine these all in chains and they're pulling him up there and gets back and lays himself on the cross. They didn't push him down. The Bible says it very clearly. He gave up his spirit. He chose the moment he was going to die. That's how much power lives inside of you. That's the power that lives in your flesh to choose that. What about the spirit working too? So... 
else does Hebrews teach about the lifestyle of today's priests, you and me? Let's go to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Let's talk about their work in the sanctuary, because priests work in the sanctuary, right? Remember 1 Peter 2, 9? All believers are royal priests. What do priests do on Sunday? They work in the temple. They work in the sanctuary. They make sacrifices, right? Okay, well, let's look at how that applies to us today. Hebrews 8, verse 1. He has a lot to say in those chapters between 5 and 8. And then he goes, the point of what we're saying is this. Let me just get to the point. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary. The true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. There is a true tabernacle. It's not that one. Right? There's a true one set up by God. That's where Jesus works. It says, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it was necessary for this one to also have something to offer. Wow. That's pretty interesting. We have a Lord who is worthy of following because as a man, he did all that God asked of him. He says, but he had to, he had to have a sacrifice to go into that true tabernacle that God made. He had to offer a sacrifice. What was it? It was himself. See, in the Old Testament, you sinned, and because of your sin, one of your animals got to die. I heard about family pets and stuff, and we've had our own family pet, and I was like, it's a dog. Until the day that he died, then I have had a kid. But you know what? You raise animals, they become dear to you. Don't tell me that they weren't crying over losing the goat, the ram, the bull. And yet, God had to show them the seriousness of their sin. Our sin kills. Our sin kills somebody every time. That's why attitude is so bad. You're killing somebody with that attitude. See, Jesus gave his entire life for others to be saved. And then he says, now come follow me. Live like I'm living for others. Seek first my kingdom. And I'll give you all the things that you want. But if you try and take them yourself, you're never going to get it. Pockets with holes. See, Romans 12. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Why? That's what Jesus did. He says, then you'll be able to approve and test what God's will is. You want to know if you're called or not? Well, you can't test it unless you're offering your body as a living sacrifice. That means you have visitors a lot. You'd be in a lot of Bible studies at least every week. You know what I'm talking about? This is just the general calling of every disciple, not the minister or the Bible talk leader or the house church leader or the shepherd. See, we are called to bear fruit. Fruit that lasts through the trials and then the fruit of new disciples that die faithful. Oh, what is it? Go, go on to verse 5. He says, they serve at a sanctuary, right? That is a copy and a shadow of what's in heaven. Now we're talking about this one, right? Now we're talking about this one. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So God... When he met with Moses on the mountain, said, all right, now we got a pretty big screen right here. Pretty cranking, like 1080p, right? HD. And some of us have 4K. They got 8K now. It's like eight times the price, but it's 8K. And God said, hey, here's all the instructions. He gave him all the instructions of how to build a tabernacle. And then 
And then he showed it to him. I don't know what K that is, but it doesn't get any better than what God showed him. I know that. I don't think you would forget that. I might in my age now, but, you know. Here's the thing. Moses went and got all the stuff. He's getting ready to build it. And right before he starts, God's like, okay, I need to warn you. I need to warn you. You need to build my tabernacle exactly like I told you to build it. Got it? Well, yeah, I got it. And he did it. Why would he stop him right beforehand? Because he's human. And we don't like to obey. We want to do our own way. Right? Like even the song, we like to do our own little ad libs and stuff. You notice that the spirit goes down when that happens because everybody's expecting to sing something else and you change everything up. Deaf people can't hear it. So they keep singing what they're used to singing. It's just a mess. We like to do our own patterns. We don't like to be held to obedience. Think about it. Why do you drive the speed limit? Isn't that interesting? Not so the roads are safe. Right? Not because, not, not because it's the right way to drive. So I won't get a ticket. That's Old Testament style thinking right there. I'll have to kill a ram. You see what I mean? Shouldn't we want to drive in a way that makes sure everybody gets home safe? We're so rebellious, we know where every street camera is in DC. Right? So that if I'm in a hurry, I'm just going to do my thing my way. You go, oh, there's no, nobody gets pulled over for tickets here. I can speed in between. So you can break the law in between. We've all done it. I'm not getting down on you. I've done it too. Now mine's recorded. They might come give me a ticket now. They do them on the cameras. Uh, well, there's a camera right there. How about that? The instructions to build the sanctuary were simple. They were not difficult to understand, just like our elementary teachings are not difficult to understand. God just wanted, if you're going to do this, call, put my name on it, do it exactly like I tell you. So if we're going to live this life that Jesus called us, we got, and we want to put Jesus' name on it, then you got to stop doing it your way and start accepting God's way. He says... In verse 9. No, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. That's you and me, by the way. Now, the lampstand was taken from them and given to us. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man preach to his neighbor saying, brother, saying, know the Lord. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete is aging will disappear soon. Now, the Bible says that That the new covenant is built on better promises. Why? The old ones were terrible. What kind of promises? I mean, what, how did he say to remember the scriptures? Write them where? On your door frames, on your homes, on your forehead, coming to church with ink all over your forehead. That's a terrible promise. I mean, I wear a CPAP and I got this big red thing on my nose where it rubs on my nose now. It's like terrible. You'd come into church looking like that with a scripture though. Would that work in this age? He goes, no. I'm just going to put it in your mind. See, when you show the scriptures, God does this work to lay it in the heart of them and the mind of the person who accepts it. They memorize it. They live by it. And you don't forget it because they live by it. He says, no longer will a man teach his neighbor. Well, 
you go, well, see, it just happens through osmosis now. You just, you have faith and there you go. No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying no longer will you read this, will a, there be a mediator between you and God, right? We show the scripture, God does the work. Faith is built if they're going to actually obey it when they say they are. If they don't go obey it, they didn't believe it. So God still does the work, even though we're involved. Why do you think he has us involved? So you won't forget the way you're supposed to be living. It's for you to be in Bible studies, not for the person. The sharing your faith with them, befriending them, getting them, influencing them to come to church and sit down and do the study is your part. God does all the rest. The tough part of actually making them believe is done by the Lord. See, unlike, unlike the world, we obey out of love. Unlike that, 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 that speed limit, we obey out of love. Not because we're going to get punished. We don't. But there are consequences, so you choose the experience of your life when you don't obey. But I love this. He says, I will remember their sins no more. That should fire you on up today. <laughs> So let's describe this tabernacle here. Verse 9, chapter 9, verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In the first room was the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Okay, so the holy place had the lampstand that says, these are my people. The table and the consecrated bread. He says, behind the second curtain, right? Because you had to go through a curtain into the first room, right? Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense, prayers to the saints, right? And the gold-covered ark. The ark contained the gold jar of manna, right? Aaron's staff that budded, something dead bearing fruit, right? And the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. Atonement cover, the blood of Jesus washing our sins, right? But we cannot discuss these things now. He says you're still lukewarm. He's still addressing that lukewarmness. He says if, you can't, if you're not going to live the right way, I can't explain it to you. You're just going to fight the difficult things. And so he goes on here. And he says, yeah, he says he can't discuss it. So behind the first curtain, the outer room, you have the lampstand, the table, the bread. Okay. Where do you go to see God's people? Where do you go to take communion? The mo so the so the holy place is church. So when they come to church and they come through the curtain, looking for a lampstand. Where's the evidence of the grace of God? Oh, oh, there's three baptisms today. Okay, I'll sit down. Okay. How's the fellowship? People bearing the fruit of the spirit, singing with all their heart. Giving themselves to God like they're practicing for heaven? Taking communion properly? Are they giving what's due the Lord? Or have they robbed him? See, the holy place is the church. And when people come into church, they should see the church. It's honoring God, worshiping him, fully committed not partially committed. What's the worst counterfeit bill you could have? The one that looks most like it, but isn't doing, isn't all of it. That's the worst counterfeit. I, I so appreciated Chanel's humility today to talk about living in a wrong way. Notice she called her sin evil, her response to being sinned against evil. That's when you know you're changing. When, when, when you get off the sin that was done and get on to your evil response to it. 
But there's another curtain that people need to look through to be able to be with God. The most holy place. Go behind the most holy place. What are you, what are you supposed to see? Sins are forgiven. The atonement cover. Aaron's Holding Aaron's staff. Bearing fruit of new Christians. Hmm. What's the most holy place? You. You are the most holy place. Why would you ever taint that with an attitude? Why would you ever taint that with impurity? Why would you desecrate the house of God? Being the most holy place. You're not the most holy place in that moment. You're squashing it deep inside of you, small as a mustard seed. This is why we sent a team. This is why Tracy and I gave up our home and my son and my mother to come be with me. How serious is it? It's that serious. You think I had to go pray about it when I was asked? I'm ready to go wherever, whenever I'm asked. I already know who my leaders are. I already know all their sin and I know they're from God. And I don't hesitate on anything I'm asked to do. Even death. I hear all the time, well, they work you so hard. Da, 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 da. So what? To death is my commitment. I don't cower down because something's not easy. I don't consider that myself a five-talent guy, but I got some talents and I give all of them. Amen? I got my shortcomings, but let me tell I give everything I have. Make no mistake, I will go out with all of myself, not part of it. And I appreciate your guys' prayers. I am having vertigo multiple times a day. I had to take a pill right before it started to hit. I was like, hold my laptop. All right, let's, let's take a little pill and go do this. So what? Why, why does it affect you so much? Oh, I don't know. Like God's not going to give you another leader if something happens? Come on, guys. We follow Jesus. Okay. These things are not hard to understand, but some of you are making them very hard to understand. People getting up, leaving early, coming late. You know, sometimes they men, but all the time. Watch online. What's that? I mean, I mean, how does Jesus really feel about it? Let's get to the truth. How does Jesus feel that you haven't baptized somebody in years? You haven't been a Bible study in months. You haven't invited anybody to church. How does he feel about that? You call yourself his follower? It's time to be his follower. Let's fill this room up. Our God deserves to be honored. He demands praise. Because you are the most holy place. That means people come into your home and they see your life and they go, holy cow, their sins are forgiven. I want a little bit of this. That wasn't just Sunday they did that stuff. They live like this every day. See, you get the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But make no mistake, it wants to control you. Oh, I, you don't like that, but I, I don't care if you like it. And Jesus doesn't either, because it's the best life when you let him control you. Right? You can't overlook things when Jesus is controlling you. You can do things you never thought possible if you let Jesus control you. But just do you, and all we're going to get is you. I want Jesus you. Right? The Spirit enables you to speak directly to God. Now, 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 consider this. Who got to go into the most holy place? Only the high priest. That means you get the honor every day that was given to the high priest. The high priest could only go in once a year. How would your life be if you only got to have one quiet time a year? And yet, and, that, and yet, some disciples have the audacity. How's your quiet time? That could have been better. How dare you? How dare you treat God like that? 
You're the most holy place and you treat God like that? You treat the most holy thing like that. How could you ever like not have a great quiet time? How could a day ever be terrible in the kingdom of God where you have the power to overcome any hardship, even at pain of death? At pain of death, you can be telling people, take care of my wife, take care of my son. How about it? That's the power that lives in you. You get to draw strength directly from the source. Right? Matrix. You see, see, you get to read this. And this is where it really comes true. No one will teach can teach each other anymore to a degree. You can only show a scripture. You get to read this and get direct revelation from God. You get the same spirit that created light, inflicted the 10 plagues on God's enemies, right? The same spirit that healed people, made Peter walk on water and raised your Lord from the dead. See, our church worldwide is the sanctuary. And the church resides, the ark of the covenant and all those things reside inside of you, the spiritual versions of those things. So why did God create you? Isn't it the question of the ages? Why are we here? He called you to come follow Jesus. To be a fisher of men. To bear fruit of the Spirit that bears the fruit of disciples that last. To be a little Jesus. So the church will be the holy place. So that you remain the most holy place. So people can come and look behind the curtain of this church. And see the lampstand. And see communion being done right. So that people can walk in here and go, these are my people. In this room, these are your people. Go to John 14. The presence of peace. John 14, the presence of peace. Verses 26 through 27. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus says, I have peace. And the world needs my peace, so I give that peace to you. So that you can give it to others, not lose it. See, as... As the most holy place. You should be going to God with loud cries and tears. Because he's always going to up the ante on the hardship. The moment you can overcome one, he's going to give you the next level. And if you're not with loud cries and tears, it's just because you're not growing spiritually. See, you're supposed to fight with loud cries and tears so that you can learn obedience from what's happening. If you're, if you're having a continued hardship, it's because you need to learn obedience in some way, and God is being your teacher. Maybe you need to learn to stop sinning, and so he's got a correctionary di- hardship. Maybe you are slated to go on a mission team, and you need to learn what you need to learn to be on that team, and so he's building you up with the hardship. And by the way, we have three people moving in in June from the dream geographic sector. And they're going to be coming on in. And that's wonderful. That's awesome. We don't know where we're going to put them exactly yet. But then we are sending three people out. And Monet Faust and Kay Michelle are going to Southland in L.A. (laughs) 
and Chanel Jones is going to the AMS in LA. See, in all of this, we find this truth to be evident. The presence of peace resides in the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Take all the peace you need. To not have peace means you're actively quenching the Spirit. God has an answer for it, but you won't accept it. So he takes your peace right back. So I'll give it to you and you're going to obey me. You know, we've had a, we had a pretty tough start to the year. And you know, and every ministry needs to be refined and, and amen. From the middle of December, we went 12 weeks without a single person added to the church. That just shows we're not accepting God's grace or being strong in it. Because if we were to accept grace, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, right? Not the other person changing, not the hardship going away, but learning from it and being built up and getting back to a place of peace. Well, that's the longest time frame Tracy and I have ever had in any of our ministries in 16 years now without somebody getting at it. And I realize I got to do something about it. I'm the leader. I need to lead the way. So we started the Gold Bible Talk. And we have a standard for the Gold Bible Talk. We call it the Gold Standard. It's really nothing more than the elementary teachings. But I'm the Bible Talk leader, so I, I, I have a firm stance to hold to that. And I delegated out the whole entire Bible Talk because I have to go places and not be there a lot. And, um, and it's pretty awesome. You know, um, we've had in the church nine additions as of today in nine weeks. Five of those have stemmed from the Gold Bible Talk. And, and yet, it's not me doing all the work. All I did was orchestrate it, set it in motion, and let everybody fly. Canadian brings like 10 visitors a week. And, and it's really great. But, but we have standards. There's daily contact in my Bible talk. All right? We are active in the chat. People post their problems in the chat, not the church, not, not the house church one, because we're a family. I said, I believe we could take this group right here, right, and extract it out and go plant a church. If you don't believe that for your Bible talk, you don't lead it anymore. Let me know you can't lead it, and we'll put somebody else in there. A Bible talk leader leads the evangelistic charge in that area, in that community. If there's no evangelism, you can't keep leading it. If you can't influence the people to get about what their purpose and mission is, then you can't lead a Bible talk. That's just the fact. We'll be long-suffering with people, but maybe we need to pull you back, get you strengthened, and when it grows, you're going to be right back in anyway because Bible talks always split to create geographic expanse. And so, and, and so, you know, at the first Bible talk, I said, you know, we're going to hold to this standard, and we are going to be fruitful, and, and you're going to lead your own studies. You bring somebody, you lead them. You know, that's the way, that's the way it works. Well, Kadesha can't couldn't lead it with Eric, so Damon's been leading it. And, uh, and the guys have been in there supporting them. And, and they, they studied the Bible with them, and they counted the cost with them as well. All right? And Eric's getting baptized today. And I think that's, that's awesome. Where, where is Kadesia? Where is Kadesia? Come on up here, girl. So, so, yeah, come on up here, daughter. Let's go. So at that first Bible talk, I said, the first person to baptize someone in the Bible talk gets uh gets the gold award you know our church won the goldie award the best church in uh, dmv and uh this one's not exactly like it so you got to make it inspiring for people. You have to know God's going to use everybody in your Bible talk. And if you don't know that, then you shouldn't be leading it. If all you're going to do is look at their flaws and, and sit in counseling times and therapy sessions, that's not, that's not what a Bible talk's for. The Bible talk is to save people. And so maybe you haven't had fruit. Well, now, now turn it around and have some fruit. But everybody in the Bible talk has a role. 
K. Michelle handles the social media stuff, right? Miss Denise handles the food, right? Everybody's got a role. Everybody's got a role, and everybody functions in their role reliably every week. And we don't do that business like, okay, everybody give me five bucks, I'm going to go buy everything and bring it. Everybody brings their own individual part. Why? Because if you leave out the tacos, then we're eating mushy meat with lettuce and, and whatever. And I don't mind doing that because we've got to see the significance of each part doing its own work. I don't make a big deal if somebody forgets something or whatnot. We just, go, we just roll with it. And, and let me tell you what, you forget the tacos. You forget taco shells one, one day. You're not going to forget them again after that. It's, just, it's one of those things that only happens once. You know what I mean? And people get trained and built up and they become reliable. And so, and, and so you need the presence of peace in your life. And that peace only resides in the spirit that's in you. But the spirit won't activate unless you're obedient to the calling you have. The power of your purpose. Go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. We're starting to wind down to a close here. Philippians 2, verse 1 through 11. There's a power to your purpose, but it takes humility. There's one thing I would not say is the strength of the church here is humility. And it needs to become, it's our weakness, it needs to become our strength. I think the, so I think social media and internet has changed us in very bad ways and stolen our humility. And I think the pandemic and virtual stuff has made us emboldened to express the nastiness that's inside of us behind the veil of a black screen. It's always been like that in chat rooms and stuff. But, um, but it, it's, it's emerged into the world now since the pandemic. Just a, like, I just, just a little side note. In Corinthians, it says that the grumbling of the Israelites, it brings something. It's still true today. Some things from the Old Testament that are true today, right? The destroying angel. Every time you complain, you open one of those windows and the destroying angel comes into the holy place. Now see if you want to keep complaining. Because you brought it in when, you, when that happens. But we got, you know, there's only one destroying angel. So if people keep complaining, it just hangs around. What's the destroying angel? So it took out Sodom, Gomorrah, you know, 185,000 Syrians in one night. So I don't know. I don't know about you. I'd rather not have the destroying angel like messing around in the holy place. You know what I'm saying? That means we need to get back to gratitude and humility and stop feeling like the, the entitlement to voice your, voice your thing loudly that you, that you don't feel. Pray until you're not angry for it, at least. And if you can't get rid of your anger, consider why with all the power that created the world, you can't muster up, stop being angry. It takes humility. Verse 1, I battle with that. I'm not down on you. I battle with the anger just like the best of them. In verse 1, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, this is called beating the dead horse, right? <laughs> it's making a spectacle of this topic. Any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete. Wait a minute. Wasn't he just wasn't Jesus talking about his, our joy being complete just a minute ago? Right? The only way the joy is complete is by being like-minded, right? Remember he said, you do what I say, then, you, then your joy will be complete? It's called being like-minded, obeying. Right? By being like-minded, having the same love, right, as Jesus, right? Being one in spirit, Right? Yeah, I just don't feel like the church is unified. Yeah, because you're not going out there making disciples like the rest of us are. Unity is not a feeling. Unity is each part doing its work. That's what unity is. Exactly the way God said to do it. Not our own little unique way. We put our own personality on things, but we have the same calling. The same way. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. You can't talk badly about someone 
without looking down upon them. And you can't think of your, them as better than you if you're talking about them badly. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. The same. Exact patterns, right? Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So check this out. In order for you to disobey God, you have to consider that you're equal with him. <laughs> Forgive. Now, I can't do that. Oh, you're equal with God. Okay. Wow, that must be nice. There's a lot of power in that. In fact, you can shut down God and all he wants to create and do with you. Just like that. Each of you should look not only to your own interests. Well, whose interests are we supposed to be looking out for? The lost. If you have a marriage problem and I have a Bible study, I'm sorry, but I'm doing the Bible study with somebody who's already who doesn't have the truth. I'll get to the person that does after that. You see, we, we got to have our priorities on straight. Well, I'm going to get with you, just not when you want it. And don't be mad about that. That's, that's, that's the way Jesus worked. You think Jesus hung around for like 20 days waiting for somebody? He was about the business. It's about soul business. And he moved on and people followed him or they just didn't, they weren't his follower. There's a timing in things, right? Life is about timing, tone, and pressure. You act when you're supposed to act, right? The timing. You don't act when it's gonna, when, it's, when you're not supposed to. Timing, right? A right tone. Any given conversation about disobedience should have several tones. A tone of, I understand. I'm, I'm human just like you. But a tone of, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not acceptable. That's not okay. That does not go down in God's church. No. You need to cut it out right now. It's not okay. You don't need to raise your voice to take a stand. Right? Oh, wow, that's, that's what was said to you? Ooh, that really hurts. Man, thank God you have the Spirit. We've got to remind each other of the truths. Get past our feelings to what the truth is. He said, but he made himself nothing. You want to be great? Make yourself nothing. Taking the very nature of the servant... Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient. See how they work together? When you're not obedient, you're not humble. There's no humility in disobedience. But, but, but you know, the way I was raised, uh, I don't care about how you're raised. This is what matters. I care, but this is what matters. Right? But this is just where I'm at. This is one I hear all the time. This is just where I'm at. Well, consider what you say. The Holy Spirit can pierce into you. Jesus could see into the heart of a man and knew what was there. Angels are not made that way. Who was Satan? He was an angel. He can't read your mind. You have to reveal to him your weaknesses. This is just where I'm at. And Satan's going, yeah, I got him. You just confirmed I got you. Sweet. All right. Hey, let's just get some reinforcements. Just stick on this one until, until, they, until, they, uh, yeah, they, until they're ready to go. Don't kill them, though, because we want to wait till the day of their death to kill them. Just... I mean, you arm Satan all day long with things you say. I'd rather be exposed by God but not have Satan hear it and keep it in my thoughts. You know what I'm saying? And I let it fly a lot. My, my whole job is speech. You think I don't blow it every day in some way, shape, or form? Of course I do. But I know who my enemy is. And I know he can't read my mind. I know he can't see what's in my heart. He can because he sees what I do. But he can't pierce in there. So stop giving up all your cards to Satan. Right. 
Become obedient even if it means dying. Even if it means dying. Today at Bible Talk Leaders, I want to encourage everybody to come back. I'm going to talk about the new dynamic between our younger leaders leading, right, and singles discipling married people. Oh, yeah, it gets real quiet. There's that pushback I was talking about, right? Find me one example of a married person discipling a married person in the Bible. You cannot find it. They were all singles discipling marrieds. It is how our churches and our movement have been built since 1979. You just don't like it right now. If you're married, raise your hand. Don't tell me you can't get help. We're a family. Don't tell me you can't get help in your marriage outside of the Bible talk leader leading your Bible talk. You just want a one-stop shop that's easy where the person that's discipling can handle any problem that you got. Let me tell you something. That does not exist just because you're familiar with the person. They can't help with everything or your marriage wouldn't have the problem it has. Okay? We need the young people to lead the evangelistic charge. We need the married people to be the marriage ministry. You know, I, I, moved, I changed the chats when I got here. There's a singles chat. There's a marriage chat, right? Put all the married people in the marriage chat. Why? We're building a marriage ministry. Not, the, not marriage Bible talks. We have mingles. Married people bring singles. It's weird for the singles. Single people bring married people. It's weird for the marrieds when they come. That's why we build mingles Bible talks, right? So that they're powerful and can, and can reach out to all kinds of people that are brought. Your marriage problem is a marriage problem that all these marrieds can help with. You're not restricted to your Bible talk. Just don't undermine what the Bible talk leader's doing in the ministry for that week. That's all, that's all we ask of that. You just, I just opened the whole world up for all of you. I mean, I don't know if you thought you couldn't call other marriage, but you've been free to do that the entire time. And that's what I'm asking you to do now so you're not worried about some single person who you say can't show you the Bible and teach it to you because they don't understand because they haven't been there. Well, Timothy had never been there. Paul never went there. Jesus never went there. That's all we see in our Bible. And so I'm going to I'm going to teach us a little more about that. And I'm actually going to show you a video that that proves to you this is the way we lead our churches. And it's going to be powerful. So please come back at 2:30. It's going to be an incredible incredible time together. Amen. <laughs> it makes God's joy complete. See, it says, then for God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue will confess, either at baptism or before they go to hell. That's Bible. And that's why God chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, so far fewer of his children reach that demise. Makes God's joy complete when you're like-minded. You know, uh, we recently watched a movie together called The Shack. And I, and I love that movie. But they perpetuate something beyond what's written. You were created to be loved. Well, yeah. What does the scripture say you were created to be loved? It says you were created to give it. And in giving it, you will be. We've got to go beyond what the world feeds into us. Satan just wants to twist the truth just a little bit. Get us off track. Your purpose powers your mission. And that produces the last point. Great power and joy. Acts 8. Let's close it out here. Acts 8, verse 4. I know it's a little bit longer today, but I believe we need it. Acts 8, verse 4 through 8. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said with evil shrieks. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So the disciples were enduring a, a, a phenomenal persecution because Stephen had just, he had just exposed in the Sanhedrin the hypocrisy of the elders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus says, Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, does he not? Stephen went in, 
preach the sermon of the ages. And they took him outside and stoned him to death. And so all the disciples were scattered. It's kind of like when we have Bible talk changes, right? We all feel scattered. And that's when the starts, right? I want to be with this person. I want to be with that person. What if we need you to go to Egypt? You're not going to be in that Bible talk anyway, right? So, so if we say we'll go anywhere, do anything for Jesus, why do we worry about a Bible talk change? And why do we worry about it being right close to where we live, where we can be more effective, because we want to be with somebody else on the other side of the city? Just go have lunch after church. Yet Stephen struggled for the truth to the point of shedding his blood and giving his life for the purpose. And, and, they, and they stoned him to death. What was he like while he was being stoned? Let's go look. Acts 6. Acts 6, verse 8. Let's talk about being mistreated here. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue, of the freedmen. Okay, so he's got opposition and persecution, right? Why? Because he was full of God's grace and power. Look what it says in verse 15. All who were sitting there in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. Now he's being mistreated, right? And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I want to challenge you, the next time you're mistreated, to well up with the power that lives inside of you, muster up all the strength you have, and sit there with the face of an angel. Stop making it so obvious the evil that lives in you. And be an ambassador of Christ. See, he's being persecuted. He's going to be killed. It was obvious when they were going to kill because people start saying, stone him, stone him. And then more people say it, more people say it. He knew what was coming. Yet he had the face of an angel. See, look at the power in his life. The power in his life. Totally, utterly at peace under intense persecution to death. We're running around going, I don't like the way that was said. How much power is in that? How much glory and honor is in, in that? And I'm, oh, I'm harping on it because it's got to stop. You're too good to do that. You're the most holy place. At his death, at his death, Stephen followed Jesus. Literally followed Jesus. The stones are hitting him, right? Remember Jesus chose his moment of death? Remember Jesus laid himself down? They're stoning him, and it's boom, 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 boom. And he's like, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, how do you want to die? Yell it out. How, many, how do you want to die? We want to like, we want to, what? We want to go to sleep peacefully. The Bible says, he said, Lord, hold this not against them. They know not what they do. And it says, he fell asleep. He fell asleep just like all of us want to fall asleep and die. That's the how powerful you and I are if we want to be. See, Stephen got the reward for having so much peace, purpose, and power in his life that he got to go to sleep, not die, with the face of an angel. See, the power of your peace powers your purpose. Your purpose is to live the lifestyle of Jesus. And if you live your purpose, you will be persecuted. And if you're not being persecuted, 
then you're not living your purpose. Maybe you're being persecuted, but you're just being done with what you say. That doesn't count. We scatter all the time. We're in the time of collecting special missions. Why? We are scattering our churches with people sending them out everywhere. And we pay, and we pay for it with each other. It's crazy. The church is the sanctuary, the most holy place. You are the most holy place. You are the superior sanctuary. You are the sanctuary, this built ironclad that cannot be cracked. Because you cannot crack the armor of God. Protect the presence of your peace today. Take back the power of your purpose. Then D.C., Delaware, Raleigh next year, Columbia, Morgantown, West Virginia, will have great joy and salvation. I love you guys. Let's bring the baptisms up. Have a wonderful afternoon.